Is it called At the Gateway, Nils? That's the chapter, so let's call it that, yeah. <laughs> at the gateway. Priscilla took a large hit from her inhaler and waited as the medicine slowly cleared her lungs. Ever since that psychiatrist had prescribed her an unending supply of Valiums, her struggle over losing Harvey had loosened somewhat. She had fought that hospital staff down to the tooth and nail, trying to get it through their heads that Harvey wasn't dead. No one dies. She had told them repeatedly, but none of these hospital workers gave a single thought to eternal life, that the body is just a shroud for the spirit. But she knew better than them and always had. The same thing had happened when she'd lost her mother a few years back, yet she had come out on top and was even able to talk with her mother from beyond the grave. It had been difficult to get into the right frame of mind and even more difficult to separate the forces of darkness from light during the journey to the home of her mother's soul. It had been cold, lonely, physically straining, but her books hadn't lied. They had gotten her there. Yes, they had gotten her there once, and they were going to get her there again. A smile spread across Priscilla's face. She knew that Harvey's spirit was waiting for her, ready to embrace her in his loving arms. She didn't need a priest to tell her that. As a matter of fact, most priests were useless. Last rites and rites beyond belonged to more entrusted hands, to her hands. Priscilla closed her eyes, trying to recall where she had read that passage about communion with the recently deceased. Was it Meg Harlan's A Gathering of Souls? Or was it Charles Duffney's The Incarnate Soul? She knew it was one of the two because both authors specialized in the work of the seance. She had followed those incantations to a T, carefully and with utmost protection. She was aware of the risk involved. Both authors had cautioned about the chance of never returning to the human vessel. She smiled, delighted by the concept. Part of her wanted to never come back to join Harvey once and for all, but reason superseded this thought and told her that she still had a business to run and employees to pay. With her gone, what would Aurora and Brent do? She had no more close living relatives, only distant ones, and they never talked to her. All of Harvey's relatives were long gone, with the exception of his sister, who had refused to acknowledge his existence when he was alive. She had to keep Enchanted Sorcerer Studios running at any cost, no matter how difficult it would be. Her thoughts were broken by the image of Harvey's face, his long soft brown hair, his brown cheeks, his sparkling blue eyes. Seeing him smile made her melt on the spot, made her want to abandon everything and join him in eternal bliss. Fully rejuvenated, Priscilla scrambled to her feet, grabbed her inhaler, slipped it into her bathrobe pocket, and headed up the stairs to their bedroom. Once in the bedroom, Priscilla went directly to the bookcase, tossing one book after another onto the floor in a desperate search to find that passage. Exhausted, she collapsed onto the floor and took a hit from her inhaler. When she looked back at the shelf, only two books were left standing praying with all her heart and soul for one of them to be the right book. Priscilla crossed her fingers, closed her eyes, and rose to her feet. When she opened up her eyes, the two titles she had been looking for all along stood out before her, A Gathering of Souls and The Incarnate Soul. Having always preferred Meg Harlan, Priscilla grabbed A Gathering of Souls. A bookmark indicated the spot she had last read. She pulled out the bookmark and carefully opened the book, which was now covered in a layer of dust. She wiped the dust off with her hand, closed her eyes, and performed one of the oldest tricks she had learned from her Ouija board days. She let her hand loose and allowed the forces of innermost knowledge to take her and lead her gracefully to the desired spot. X at the Gateway 
gather crystals and stones alike and present them in a pentagram enclosed by a circle of white talcum powder. Each of the five points of the pentagram require a drop of the initiate's blood to land safely on each rock or crystal. One candle must be lit for each point, each representing the five elements, earth, wind, fire, water, and ether, to be placed beside each stone or crystal. After the circle is complete, the initiate must meditate on the fathers of the deep, the queens of the risen world, and the princes of both light and darkness, and repeat three times, Come thou one in whom doth preside the soul of each man living and dead, taketh me to name of host, where I can abide with him, and enter into a union with all worlds. Priscilla ripped the page out of her book and stuffed it into the pocket of her yeah. bathroom. Running from the bedroom and nearly tripping over the stairs in a frenzy to reconnect with Harvey. The seconds slipped through her fingers like hourglass sands. If she waited too long, she would never see him again. On her way down the stairs to the kitchen, she tried to remember where she put the box with crystals, candles, and talcum powder that she had used in the communion with her mother's spirit. Pausing at the front door of the house, Priscilla took a much needed hit from her inhaler and thought real hard. Where had she performed the seance? Then the image of the puppet heads loomed at her in half light and she knew the basement. She headed down there as fast as her weary limbs would carry her, not even slowing down once. The stairs were especially painful for her, but she managed them somehow. Her powers of intuition kicked in as soon as she entered the basement a bright illumination shining from underneath the workbench where they cast the plaster molds for puppet heads. She raced over to the table, heart pounding and legs shaking, and grabbed the box from where it had been sitting for the last six years. Her mind was completely overwhelmed with the immense power emanating from the box. She had only one thing on her mind, and that was being with Harvey again, flying around with him, having their soiree be endless and timeless. The room was stuffy, the air stagnant. She opened the windows and took another pull from her inhaler, wishing then that she could just discard the thing for good, to sprout wings and be free, light, and happy. Seeing that there was too much light, even with the setting sun, she let down the blinds. Feeling the draw of the spirit world, Priscilla collapsed onto the old wooden floor and fumbled through the contents of the box. With artistic meticulousness, she took the first five stones that touched her hand, laid them out without even measuring the distance between them, grabbed the talcum powder, and as though a divine straight edge were connected to her wrist, she drew the talcum powder lines. She stepped back and reveled in the immaculate pentagram she had just drawn and lit the candle, placing one beside each stone, just as the book had directed. As she pricked each of her fingers and let a small dark drop of blood fall on each stone, she saw Harvey's light blue eyes smiling at her, sparkling with light from the world beyond. Wherever he was, she wanted to be there with him. Taking in as much air as her lungs could draw, Priscilla cleared her mind of all distractions, all thoughts, all images. Ego loss was essential for this kind of interlude, and nothing could interrupt it. She picked up the sheet of paper and began reading, loudly and effortlessly, enunciating each syllable. Come thou one in whom doth preside the soul of each man living and dead, taketh me to Harvey where I can abide with him and enter into a union with all worlds. Slowly at first, everything got numb prickly. The rushing sound of waves crashing against rocks entered her ears, and she was thrust into the memory of her childhood, where she was walking along the shore of the Oregon coast, outside of her mother's reach, free as the four-year-old weed that she was. She was there again, picking up the conch shell for the first time, sucked in by its swirling vortex. She slipped into the inner spirals of the shell, one with the sound, pulled effortlessly, as if she were smaller than a simple grain of sand. She was rising into the clouds high above the ocean, sailing over the seas, 
The sun here was brighter than any she'd seen on all the sunniest June days of her life combined. From behind a cloud was Harvey's face, as large as a Greek god's, smiling at her, lifting her up, bringing the light of the sun with him. He brought her small body up to his large lips and she kissed him, the warmth of the sun shining through his head and entering her mouth, melting her. Unencumbered joy pulsed through her and she spoke with him, eternities of conversations in less than a split second, a total knowing, a living moment beyond life itself. Then the wings that were holding her started to tremble and she shivered with cold. She wanted the light back. Where had it gone? When she looked up, Harvey's face was no longer there and in its place was a large black swarming mass. She wanted the thing to go away. It was making her so cold, frail, and scared. When she looked in its center, two red eyes formed, and then a grin, staring right through her and piercing her insides. She screamed, but to no, but no sound came out. She was mute in its presence. She tried praying, but its beaming infrared eyes wouldn't let her go. It was crushing her, suffocating her. The edges of its face whisked around like storm clouds flying around and returning like a drunken swarm of flies. Like a bloodhound on the trail of a fresh killing, this thing sensed her strongest fear, her weakest point. She began to fall, her insides rising out of her and pushing toward this thing's open, gaping mouth. She landed with a thud. Above her, the room was spinning and she couldn't breathe, but she tried. She tried, whatever she was blocking, her throat pressed harder. Then the thought entered her mind, asthma attack, I'm having an asthma attack. The more she repeated it in her mind, the faster it got, as if someone was narrating it for her. Asthma attack, asthma attack, asthma attack. The narrating became raucous shouting, drumming at her faster and faster. Asthma attack, asthma attack, asthma attack, asthma attack, asthma attack. When she looked up this time, a large man was standing above her and the words were streaming out of his mouth. A string of hell's worst profanities. She tried to cover her ears, but he wouldn't let her. He pressed down on them, making her deaf. When she tried to take a breath, he pressed down with his hands, strangling her. Laughing all the while, his large red eyes looking into her with hate, his dirty face and stained teeth lingering inches from her face. In a flash of revelation, it all came to her. He's the plantation ghost. She still had a chance. She reached into her pocket and felt around for her inhaler. Nothing. She checked the other pocket, empty. Panicking, she struggled to get up, but the hands pressed harder against her throat, keeping her down. For a moment, she prayed for Jesus Christ to come and save her from this evil, and with all her might, she forced him off her chest. Though her vision was blurred, she could see the inhaler lying on the other side of the room. She tried crawling toward it, but with each foot that she crawled, the inhaler moved in equal distance, evading her grasp. The man reappeared, holding the inhaler and dragging it with his hand. He was still laughing, and got louder and louder, until her lungs gave out with one final... Cool. Yeah, awesome. Nice. Thank you. It's yeah. wild. I love it. Great. Yeah. Did you hear it this time? Yeah. You can hear the mute. You can hear the music more. Yeah. Yeah. The um, yeah the vocals got drowned out, but by the lead guitar at the end. But other than that, it was pretty good. Pretty clear. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Now the next audio book. I gotta. Uh, you know, yeah. I'll try to publish that. <laughs> And write again. You know, I'm I'm afraid I'm just gonna write like a more, you know, kind of like happy go less dark of a story <laughs> in my next novel. You know, but I needed to get it out of my system. Well, it cool. doesn't have to be happy. I mean, there's oh, tons I, of darkness in the world that needs to be talked about. Yeah, I think I, but I want to balance it out with like, you know. Uh, Let's just say the story is not redemptive, if you will. 
it's more neil kind of just everything descends into chaos in a sense but i guess that's a story that needs to be told